Banen. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action. What's up, everyone? I'm Monis Rose. This is Restaurant Fiction, and today's fictional restaurant is none other than Choky Chicken. Featured in the Nickelodeon classic and recent Netflix film, Rocco's Modern Life. Rocco's Modern Life. We're talking to the show's creator, Joe Murray. Joe gets real about how food influences not only what he writes about, but how he draws his characters. Anyway, I am talking too much like I always do. Here's our review of Choky Chicken and our conversation with Joe. Go. <laughs> you, you, you never know. You never know. I'm just saying. This is, yes. I'm it, another. <laughs> everything's the truth. I swear to mom. I don't know. It might not be the uh, truth. I don't know. Just might be a story. I don't know. Uh, choky chicken. Guys, the... Fried chicken business is a very serious game to play. And what we're saying is if you're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk because there is the ever-present uh, fast food franchises. Now we have Nashville f- f- hot fried chicken. We also have the b- brick-and-mortar buffalo wings. We also have Korean fried chicken wings. And then we have the mom pa, uh chicken joints that Grammy used to make. So where does Choky Chicken play? Well, it brings it with the biggest of the big, the fast food franchises. And it does walk the walk. It really does. You see, the low rent, greasy as hell, fast food dream. It's like a time warp back in the 80s with that, with those, you know, like those awful in your face advertisements, like boom, 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 boom. You remember, well, anyway, Let's get real here. You don't go to Choky Chicken for the ambiance. You don't go for the advertisement. You go for the chicken. Now, let's get right into it. You see, Choky Chicken is that nice balance between gourmet and that fast food up the supply chain uh, corporate goodness. Every piece, it's brined for 12 hours. Yes, it is brined. And then it sits overnight in a dredge before a second coating uh, hits the fryer. And between from the fryer from to heat lamp and then wax paper, there is a level or a layer that people do not see, or I should say anthropomorphic animals do not see. And that's when it is tossed in some more rendered fat, which gives it that, you know, je ne sais quoi, I'm mispronouncing that term, but anyway, that added depth of fat and flavor. And, the crunch. You see that ubiquitous crunch? It's thick, and you hear it with every single bite. It's almost how to describe it like um, the thickness of a breading you would get, one would get with uh, fish and chips. And if choky chicken or any piece, whether it be white meat, dark meat, does not kill you, it will only make you stronger. And also, the extra sugary beverages then will probably uh, do you in and make sure you meet your maker in any time soon. Long live Choky Chicken. All right, we are talking to Joe Murray, the creator of Rocco's Modern Life. Uh, tell me about that review. Tell me um, what you'd like to add, what we would like to defend. The floor is yours. <laughs> well, I, I've never heard Choky Chicken described that way. Um, and that's, that's very interesting makes it sound a lot better than I think it really is. Um, in one of our episodes, we, we had a scene where uh, all the chickens come in for an interview first before they get accepted for choking chicken. So the personality has to fit. I think her name is Helen. So uh, one of the chickens comes in. And anyway, she's very perky. But um, yeah, it, it, uh, it basically it, uh, was a place for Heifer to meet his death and then later on, it was it was a, a symbol of American franchise that ended up at the top of the Eiffel Tower. So <laughs> we've used it a few times. And then 20 years later, when we did the Netflix special, 
we had a whole, we had a lot of scenes with it that it turned into kind of a tender greens and it had kale salad and, and all sorts of stuff. And, and the, the fat logo chicken turned, got really skinny. So <laughs> that's, that's what happened. So t- tell me about this name. How did you name it? Where did the name, what's the story behind Chokey Chicken? It's very funny because we were sitting around the writer's room talking about the chicken place and, and that we, we need a place where Heifer chokes on a chicken bone and dies and then he goes to hell. But we couldn't say hell. We had to say heck. So, um, and he meets the devil whose name is Peaches. So we said, so I was like, uh, so I don't, I don't know if it came up during the writer's meeting, but, but at some point we were like, what's the name of this, of this place? And and one of our uh, one of our artists said, "Can we call it Chokey Chicken?" After the term of choking the chicken as a term for pleasuring yourself. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I said, "I don't think I don't think that's going to fly." So we we came up with some other names, and so we decided to try to do Chubby Chicken. And everything you do in network TV has to go through a department that checks and sees if there's any legal problem with using a name. So like if Bob's bait and tackle, if there really is a Bob's bait and tackle in Alabama on some street corner, then you can't use it. So um, it turns out there was a chubby chicken somewhere. So I went in to see one of the executives who was in charge of the show and she goes, yeah, chubby chicken is taken. And I said, Oh, that's a problem. What if we used a uh, choky chicken? And I, I was for sure that she was just going to laugh and say, yeah, that's not going to happen. She was, Oh, that sounds really good. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, yeah, let's do Chokey Chicken. So I went back to the guys and I'm like, we're, we're going to do Chokey Chicken. They go, no way. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do Chokey Chicken. So, um, but it took it took a few seasons for somebody to uh, say, you know, maybe we shouldn't say Chokey Chicken anymore. Maybe we should call it something else because I guess some parents wrote in and complained about it. But yeah, it was approved as a name, and it's and it was a good name because that's what he does. He chokes on it. <laughs> he does, you know. And I mean, um, and speaking of the character going on, Heifer, like, can you describe in terms of food how to draw Heifer? <laughs> So, you know, as the creator of a show, when you design characters, you have to find ways of explaining how uh, the art, uh, you have to explain to everybody how to draw them because they have to all have to draw like you. So you find creative ways of, of doing it. And I started noticing that when I drew Heifer, I would draw him, his body was like a hamburger, which makes sense. <laughs> and it's weird that he eats hamburgers because it's kind of cannibalistic. And his mouth was like a hot dog. So, so I, so I said, start out with a hamburger and then put a hot dog. And then, and then his head was like a tennis ball can, which is not edible, but I mean, if you're a goat, maybe it is. And so I kind of tied things into food because he's really a food guy and he loves food and not that he's like into gourmet food, but he'll eat anything. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's how I started. Do you relate, um, when you're, when you're teaching, um, Others, how to draw? Do you ever oh, usually relate food groups to the characters you draw? Like this person looks like a Sunday, that one looks like a, um, a a can of tuna. Only if their personality has something to do with it. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> you know, actually, I, I have a I have kind of a food story about Please. how how Heifer came about because he was based on a friend of mine that I had growing up, and. Um, this guy uh, would um, keep a jar of water in his refrigerator, and he used to love bologna sandwiches. And he used to just just pound these bologna sandwiches down. And then whenever he had a bologna sandwich, he would have a mouthful of bologna sandwich. He would take this jar of water and he'd swig it, and then some of the bologna would go back into the into the jar. And he always would offer you a sip of his water out of his. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm gonna pass on the baloney water, but have at it yourself. That was Heifer. That and and so many things that he did were like that. He was he was just he, you know 
he was a great, he was a good friend, but he was uh, full of personality. How did you find your voice, Joe? How did you find your voice and how would you describe it? I think it started when, um, when I was in high school, I, I was really into cartooning from really young. And then I started doing cartoons uh, for the school paper, which would kind of poke fun at my classmates and the teachers. And I would basically like find something that I thought was pretty idiotic and, and kind of go after it. And, and ironically enough, I, I don't know if you want to get political here, but um, my school was very Republican and, and I don't know why, but, um, but when it came time to vote for things like, um, they wouldn't vote for anything. They just thought, um, anyway, so I did a cartoon where I thought that the, my, my high school class was the most likely to be held under a dictatorship. And, and, um, ironically enough, look what happened in the last four years. Um, and they all supported him too, which is really crazy. Anyway, uh, all my classmates. So no, not all of them. I won't say. Uh, so anyway, so I started. So I would do political cartoons for the high school paper, also. And then I started. And then the uh, a San Jose paper where I grew up, a real paper, uh, saw my stuff and asked me to start doing political cartoons for their paper. So at sixteen, I was doing political cartoons. So. So I was like finding things within the political realm, but also around in the city that we'd, I would poke fun at or I would, you know, have an opinion about. So that's really how that all started. And and uh, and then I started trying to do comic strips and and then um, then I started doing independent films and my independent films were all just a relatable kind of a, a scenario, you know, that uh, would would kind of get expanded into a story of something that we you know we do as humans, and then uh, and then when Nickelodeon asked me to come up with that idea for a show, that was you know I, that's what I did. So it kind of went off on on that, and so that's that was that was really all the things that I would do. I was very um, I was always getting into trouble with the things that I was saying too. So um, I still am. And before we, we switch more to uh, Camp Lazo, so how significant is Chokey Chicken to Rocco's modern life? Well, it turned into a, a big, a big part of it because it was, it, it was, uh, and we kept coming back to it as kind of a symbol of American gluttony. You know, you you were asking me um, some of these questions about my my memories of the of uh, childhood with with restaurants and with food and stuff and and I grew up in the '60s, so it was like the time when frozen foods first started coming out. And my mother, I think, was the first one on the block to get a microwave. <laughs> the food was, you know, I love my mother, but she was not, you know, the best cook. And then we would go to these restaurants that um, were kind of like, there was one called By the Bucket. And so you're like, yeah, you know, it's like we're farm animals and we're going to a restaurant where you get your food out of a bucket. But there's a famous chicken place where you get your food out of a bucket also. So, uh, <laughs> But I, I always felt like <laughs> that was a symbolic aspect of eating um, in America. I mean that that is also one of, one of the big differences with eating in in Belgium, because in America you get big plates of. I mean, you never leave a restaurant hungry, but in Belgium, they're it's very small portions and very small little plates, and and I make fun of because you know I, I I'm, I'm a coffee guy too, but they like coffee too, but they get them in these little tiny little Barbie. Uh, cups and and I'm used to like <laughs> venti yeah <laughs> I, I oh I, I hear you you know um, but we'll say you know you you did a switch of food you went from like greasy frass chicken to then in Camp uh, Laszlo you had uh, Chef McMusley um and he was more of like a health nut. He was a vegetarian, and he really wanted to promote more healthy eating 
Uh, why the contrast and the change, if you if you don't mind me asking? Actually, it's pretty funny because with Rocco, it was like the first time. I, I had been an independent animator before Rocco and, and, an, and an illustrator. I, I did okay money-wise, but um, and I wasn't in it for the money. So it, it was just, you know, I paid my bills. We bought a house, you know, all the, you know, it was, it was just, but Rocco, I made a lot of money, which was nice, but suddenly things changed with how I approached, you know, things that were in my life and, and the, and the crowds that we were running with were a little different and they, they were sort of like this spa crowd, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and then, and then I had kids and they started going to this preschool that was like crazy spa parents and, 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 um, like Ben Stiller's kids went there and, you know, it was, it was a lot of celebrities and their kids and, and they, you know, we would go to birthday parties at their, at their houses and they would have a butler serving popcorn, you know, stuff. It was weird. So what I noticed was, is that, that they all kept trying to get the kids to have, I mean, besides popcorn, but to have this kind of spa diet and, uh, <laughs> So I, so I started kind of, you know, so that kind of like worked its way in, you know, to, yeah, I just pictured going to a camp because there was a camp that kids went to that there was like a, a, a vegan menu, you know, and, and there were kids that were vegan because their parents were that way. And, and I just found that very interesting to see how that would work out. But there was a Camp Lazlo episode, I think it was a Halloween special where McMusley is having the day off or something and somebody uh, orders up mystery meat. And so uh, the meat comes out of a can, like kind of like dog food, right? And, and, it, and it comes to life and, and uh, starts eating everything like the blob and, and it comes out. There's a guy on the show, but... But somebody after that, after I we I ran that one, they said, "Do you have something against meat?" <laughs> A little bit, I do. You're you're giving advice to um, say like a smart driven emerging animator or a smart driven emerging writer or whatever or just a person, and it's like you need to say, "Hey kid, hey young youth." You need to ignore this advice. What is the advice this person needs to ignore? Do something that makes a lot of money. That's that's the advice you should ignore. <laughs> yeah, that's not what it's about. If you happen to make a lot of money because you've done something that you enjoy doing and you that you feel like is right for you, that's fine. But to actually go for it for that particular reason. Yeah, my father was horrified that I was going to be an artist and, and uh, because I wasn't going to make any money. Like, that's what he kept saying. You're never going to make any money. You should just go to work for IBM and be in computers. And, uh, and you get a pension. And look at me. I'm going to have retirement. Like, he was saying this to me when he was in his 30s. You know, I was like, I'm living for my retirement. Uh, that's kind of sad. But yeah, I mean, I went through a lot of a lot of lean years being an artist. But to me, it was it was there was nothing else that I wanted to do. That was what I wanted. And and there were actually times when I tried to get a job at something else besides being an artist, and they wouldn't hire me. So I don't think <laughs> you know when you when you talk about things that didn't work out in your life and food related, I couldn't get hired by McDonald's, which is. Um, a good thing and a bad thing. But at the time, I thought, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I can't even get hired by McDonald's. That's pretty sad. And uh, But it turned out that right after that, I got a job doing caricatures at an amusement park. I was 16. So that's good that I did. You're going to get a lot of advice. And there's a lot of things in the society that are very um, money-based. And um, I don't have anything against money. It's just it's just how you spend your time and how you spend your life. And if you're going to have regrets when you look back and say, you know, I only did that for the money, because you're not going to take it with you. I'm sorry to say, it's going to stay behind, and and your Ferrari is going to stay behind too. And so, it sounds cliche to, to say follow your bliss, but but it's true. But stay out of the results. That's that's the thing that's really difficult. 
because when you when you go after something you know you, like like you love food you love you know you, you love cooking it you love talking about it but if you said the only reason why I'm doing this is to become a master chef at blah 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 restaurant and that doesn't happen for you then you know, but you still have this experience all the, all along the line that's really beneficial. So, I like to say, go after what excites you, what what your passion is, but don't don't bank on the results. Don't like try and stay out of that. That's like not your business. You'll find your way into whatever. Like I had never never I would have thought that I was going to be doing a, a TV show. Like I would have said, you're crazy if I ever thought about it. Uh, but it happened and it turned out really great. So. You know, and that's just because I loved animation and I loved writing and I loved cartoons and, and I did, that's all I followed. So things just open up. I guess that is my uh, follow up. Yeah. How often do you take a fledgling writer versus a much more experienced one? I do it all the time in, in all the areas uh, on a show because to me, there's talent and, and talent, if you have the talent, you can be, you, you, I don't like to say train because I, but you can, you can kind of be honed in to, to what we're trying to do. And the ideas, the original raw ideas are the most important part. And so I like, I like people who've never done some of these things before. I, I, I find it refreshing. So um, sometimes it doesn't work very rarely, but, but for the most part, you, you can, you can kind of bring that person around to what we're trying to do. Excellent. Yeah. Where can people find you, Joe? JoeMarieStudio.com is my business site. I also have a, a personal blog at Joe, JoeMurray.be, which is a Belgian uh, website, which is my personal blog where I can get spacey and, and uh, political and not have it, you know. You can get all the hate mail from that class, from your uh, high school class who uh, loves being under a dictator. <laughs> Well, a lot of them are Facebook friends, and so I, I posted some anti-Trump uh, political cartoons, and so I got, I got it. Yeah, <laughs> is that a good thing? Is that a good way to end it? That was that was amazing. Thank you, Joe. And in case you weren't listening, you want to find out more about Joe and his work? Watch Rocco's Modern Life, either the show or the film. Watch Camp Laszlo. Watch his current PBS show, Let's Go Luna. And his personal website, it's joemurray.be. Dot .be because that's in Belgium, not the U.S. So it's J-O-E-M-U-R-R-A-Y dot B-E. And as for us at Restaurant Fiction, we have plenty of episodes wherever you found us. If you want to start a conversation, hit me up, monis at restaurantfiction.com. Love to learn about the people who love Restaurant Fiction. And until next time, keep it real, keep it fresh. And always keep on the flip side. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. 